I'm happily settled in life, having married into a wealthy family, while Mason mockingly remarked on my seemingly simple lifestyle. As we sat in the hotel lobby, his sharp voice cut through my calm, taunting me with his latest update. He boasted about his new wife, who is none other than the daughter of the president of Goldsmith Enterprises. Mason's laughter, tinged with pride, filled the air, but it was the mention of Goldsmith Enterprises that grabbed my attention. I knew that name, but couldn't quite place it at first. Then, it clicked. Mason continued to gloat, unaware of the humor I found in his boasting. My name is Patricia, and I'm 37, living contentedly with my husband Mason. I work in my family's real estate business, handling mostly administrative duties while my father, the president, oversees major strategies. As an only child, I'm expected to one day lead the company. Despite the looming responsibility, I maintain a careful balance between my personal and professional life, especially around Mason. He completed high school and works for a moving company, a demanding job that I respect. To avoid making him feel inadequate, I rarely discuss my university degree or my anticipated future as president of the company. Mason and I met through a mutual friend during college. After my friend's move, handled by Mason's company, she introduced us. Initially, Mason was interested in her, but after she turned him down, we got to know each other. His easygoing nature complemented my meticulousness, and our relationship flourished. We married in our late 20s after a brief courtship. Our marriage has been smooth, bolstered by the warm acceptance of Mason's parents, a refreshing contrast to the typical in-law challenges some of my friends face. Despite Mason's demanding job, often keeping him out until late, physically exhausting him, he remained committed to our marriage. Even on his toughest days, he'd express gratitude as I waited up to share dinner with him. I felt fortunate to have such a devoted husband, but after a year of marriage, our peaceful life began to show signs of strain. One night, as we settled into bed, Mason unexpectedly brought up the topic of having children. His tone was tinged with irritation, catching me off guard. I had thought about starting a family too, and though we weren't actively trying, I believed it would happen naturally with time. I reassured him, It's only been a year, there's no rush. I wanted children, but I knew stressing about it wouldn't help. To calm the situation, I adopted a relaxed demeanor, but Mason, more assertive than usual, quoted statistics. You know, there's about a 90% chance of conceiving within a year for couples not using contraception. Not well versed in such specifics, that figure sounded surprisingly high to me. If you're concerned, maybe we should both get tested, I suggested, thinking it wise to address any potential issues together. However, Mason's reaction was unexpectedly harsh. What are you implying that it's my fault? Usually it's the woman's fault, he retorted, his tone filled with contempt. It was the first time he'd spoken to me this way. I hadn't accused him of anything. I merely suggested a joint approach to find clarity. Yet, Mason concluded I was blaming him and added, it's definitely the woman's fault, as if to underline that I was the problem. I wanted to respond, but I was too shaken, barely managing to reply. Of course. So just you get tested. I'm too busy with work. I have a job too, you know. You're just coasting along in your dad's company, he snapped. His words stung. I never just coasted, although my role involved many administrative tasks. I was actively learning management skills from my father in preparation to lead the company someday. That night, any attempt at discussion was met with curt replies, and we fell asleep with our backs turned in silence, a heavy air hanging between us. From then on, Mason's attitude toward me shifted drastically. Returning home late one evening after a discussion about the future with my father, I found Mason irate over dinner, not being ready. I'm sorry, I just got home 15 minutes ago. I'll start cooking now. Just wait a little, please, I hurriedly explained, but Mason dismissed it. That's typical of a small company's boss's daughter. He didn't realize the scale of my father's business, a significant real estate company with hundreds of employees. 
His assumptions and the increasing bitterness made navigating our daily lives more challenging, casting a shadow over what had once been a loving and supportive relationship. Arguing seemed pointless as I hurried to the kitchen, promising Mason I'd cook immediately. Have a drink and relax while you wait, I suggested, knowing how alcohol seemed to soothe him. It saddened me that our relationship had come to rely on his evening drinks to avoid tension. I despised being scolded, but if it helped keep peace even temporarily, I reluctantly saw it as a necessary evil. The next day, Mason's cold demeanor lingered as he left for work, his parting words sharp. Make sure dinner's ready when I get home. I exhaled deeply, my mind on the day ahead. I had scheduled a day off to visit the gynecologist for fertility testing, something Mason had insisted on, though he refused to participate himself. It was frustrating to go through this alone, but complaining wouldn't help. If the problem lay with me, I wanted to start treatment immediately. Understanding that fertility could decline with age, I was eager to address any issues soon. The clinic was crowded, and I waited an hour before my examination. After a series of tests, the doctor informed me that the results would be available at my next appointment. The possibility that I might be the one with fertility issues was daunting, but I was ready to take whatever steps were necessary. When Mason returned home that evening, I told him, I went for the fertility test today. His response was curt. Figures. If the problem's with you, it's good you're getting tested. Let me know the results. His assumption that I was to blame for our difficulties in conceiving was hurtful. Six years passed and I turned 37. Our attempts to have a child continued without success, and it seemed Mason had resigned himself to not becoming a father. His late nights became more frequent, and sometimes he didn't come home at all. When he did, he'd say he was out drinking and singing karaoke until dawn. His behavior reminded me more of a carefree college student than a committed husband, which was incredibly frustrating. My work had become more demanding, and the dream of starting a family had to be sidelined. But Mason's recent actions were becoming intolerable. His disregard for our life together was painfully obvious. One day, after Mason left the house on his day off, I noticed he had forgotten his smartphone in the living room. I picked it up, intending to place it in his room, but it rang just then. The caller ID displayed a name, Diana. Assuming she was a colleague, I answered to let her know Mason had left his phone at home. Hey, Mason, you're late. I've been waiting for 50 minutes. Hurry up or we'll miss the park opening. We haven't had a date in so long, a flirtatious voice said from the other end. The mention of a date stunned me, and I quickly hung up my heart racing. This woman wasn't just a colleague. She was someone Mason was seeing romantically. Holding his phone, proof of his infidelity clenched in my hand, I felt a mix of shock and anger. While I struggled with potential infertility, Mason had been carelessly engaging in an affair. His recent distance suddenly made sense, and I stood there trembling with indescribable anger at the betrayal. Realizing that Mason no longer needed me in his life was a devastating blow, but discovering his betrayal made the situation even more unbearable. Determined to confront the issue head-on, I began gathering evidence of his infidelity. Unlocking his smartphone using his birth date was effortless. The call history and messages were dominated by exchanges with someone named Diana, full of affectionate and intimate words that turned my stomach. I meticulously documented everything, taking photos with my phone before returning his device to its usual spot, acting as if nothing had changed. A month passed in this eerie state of our fractured marriage until one day, my father, the president of our company, called me into his office. I have something important to discuss with you, he said solemnly. His grave tone caught me off guard and I braced myself for serious news, which only compounded the stress I was already feeling. That evening, perhaps sensing the inevitable, Mason suggested that we consider separating. I was already contemplating how to address the divorce given his infidelity. So his initiation was unexpectedly convenient. Yes, let's divorce, I agreed quickly. Mason seemed taken aback by my readiness, possibly hopeful about his future with Diana. 
Despite the sting of seeing his relief, I signed the divorce papers he presented. I can file these tomorrow. I'll be leaving this house, he said nonchalantly. Are you sure about the mortgage? I asked casually, suspecting that he hadn't fully considered his financial situation without me. His job was demanding but not lucrative, and I doubted his ability to manage the mortgage payments on his own. Nevertheless, he was confident, or perhaps just naive. Given his betrayal, I felt no obligation to ease his transition. I moved back to my parents' house a few days later. They were initially worried about my well-being but became furious when I explained Mason's infidelity. They supported my decision to leave him, reassuring me repeatedly that parting ways was the best course of action. Throwing myself into work, I tried to move past the emotional turmoil of my failed marriage. A year flew by in a blur of commitments and projects. One evening, seeing how engrossed and tired I had become, my father suggested a break. Why don't you take a trip? It's going to get busy starting next month, he advised concerned about my well-being. Grateful for the suggestion and feeling mentally exhausted, I decided to take a solo trip to the Northeast, craving a change of scenery and some peace. The air in the Northeast was crisp and refreshing, seeming to cleanse my weary soul. I interacted with locals who were incredibly kind and helpful, gradually mending my spirit. I booked a stay in Los Angeles at a renowned hotel, deciding to indulge in the best experience possible. After checking in, I relaxed in the lobby with a welcome drink, the fatigue from my journey melting away. I felt so at peace that I half-joked about moving to Los Angeles. Just then, a familiar voice pierced through the calm. Huh, hey, what are you doing here? I turned, startled, to find Mason entering the lobby with two large suitcases. The unexpected encounter with my ex-husband was the last thing I anticipated on this healing journey. Surrounded by the elegant charm of the Los Angeles hotel lobby, I felt a sudden jolt of reality as I spotted Mason entering with a young woman on his arm. She looked to be in her early 20s with flawless skin, bold makeup, and striking red nails that contrasted sharply against the chilly northeastern weather. Her attire was bold too, a short skirt despite the cold. My eyes locked onto them in disbelief. Why are you here? And who is she? I couldn't help but blurt out, my curiosity getting the better of me despite my doubts about wanting the answers. Oh, let me introduce you, Mason said with a hint of excitement I hadn't seen in a long time. This is Diana, my new wife. We're on our honeymoon. And guess what? She's the daughter of a wealthy businessman. The name Diana hit me like a wave. She was the same Diana from the phone call months ago. I felt a surge of discomfort at his obvious pride in marrying someone so much younger and wealthily connected. You're here alone? That's sad, Mason sneered, his voice dripping with disdain. Beside him, Diana eyed me with a smirk. Hey, Mason, is this your ex-wife? She looks old. Hurry up with the check-in, she said, her tone sharp. Irritated, I managed to keep my composure as Mason nonchalantly draped an arm around her, boasting, yeah, I'm set for life now, marrying into money. You keep struggling in your modest life. Mason's high-pitched laugh cut through the serene atmosphere of the lobby, a stark contrast to the tranquility I had been enjoying. He continued to flaunt his new life. Yeah, Diana is Goldsmith's daughter. You know, Goldsmith Enterprises. He added, seeming overly proud. The mention of Goldsmith Enterprises rang a bell. I recalled it just as Mason's face lit up with a childlike glee. Impressive, huh? Her family's loaded. They even paid off our house mortgage quickly. Thanks for making the divorce easy, Patricia, he said sarcastically. Yeah, I know them. They're in that big building downtown, right? I've been there, I replied calmly, barely phased by his remarks. Mason looked surprised. Oh, you've been there? Well, her family owns a huge company, so breaking up with you was the right choice. He smirked maliciously. I nodded, still calm. That building? It's part of our real estate holdings, I mentioned casually, as if recalling a minor detail. What do you mean our real estate? Mason and Diana chimed in together, both perplexed. That building is rented by my father for his most prestigious office. I'm not sure if your company is involved in real estate, but it's certainly not a shabby building, I explained with a serene tone. Their skepticism was palpable. I paused, knowing there was no turning back. Yes, I know how grand it is. I was there when my father purchased that building for about $500 million. Recently, he was complaining about a tenant not paying their rent. Turns out it was your company. 
In fact, my father is a real estate magnate with assets worth $5 billion, and that building is one of them. Goldsmith Enterprises has been the tenant for the past few months, and they hadn't paid their rent, I revealed, watching their reactions closely. Diana burst out laughing, disbelief written all over her face. That can't be true. Our company's doing great, she claimed, still laughing, but the shock in her eyes told a different story. Despite the shock of seeing Mason with his new wife, I was determined not to be drawn into their drama. Yet Diana's loud claims that their company could surely pay the rent echoed around us, hinting at denial or deceit. Her tone was dismissive, suggesting I was lying just to create discord between her and Mason. Realizing a simple conversation wouldn't suffice, I pulled out my smartphone right there in the hotel lobby. I'm here with the daughter of Goldsmith Enterprises, I told my dad over the phone. Can you send me a photo of the rent reminder notice? Within moments, my father sent a clear image of the notice addressed to Goldsmith Enterprises, showing four months of unpaid rent. I showed the image to Mason and Diana, doubting they could dismiss it as fake, given the immediate proof. See, if you don't pay soon, we might have to consider legal action. What are you going to do? I asked calmly. Diana's confidence wavered as she mumbled, Come to think of it, Dad has been stressed lately talking about slow sales and firing a lot of employees. Mason, however, seemed to spiral into denial, accusing me of fabricating the story to split them up. You're just trying to trick us and tear us apart, aren't you? You're still that kind of person trying to get back at me for remarrying. Your tactics are dirty, he shouted, causing me to step back, shocked by his loud, accusing voice. His words brought back painful memories of our marriage, of all the harsh things he had said when things got tough between us. But now, standing here, I was no longer the person who took his words silently. What are you even saying, Mason? Do you really think I still have feelings for you? How foolish! I've long been over a man like you. In fact, I feel sorry for Diana getting caught up with someone like you, I said, my voice steady but firm. Did you marry her just for her money? You had shallow reasons for marrying me too, like wanting to get married quickly and wanting kids. And who was it that left me when he found out we couldn't have kids? Who called me useless for being infertile? You're to blame for all of it, yet you think I still have feelings for you? You must be out of your mind. Mason's face turned red with anger. You're just an arrogant old hag. You probably can't even get married or have kids anymore. Diana and I are planning to have fun making a baby after this trip, he retorted, his voice thick with desperation. It was then I decided to reveal the truth, to finally put an end to his assumptions. Oh, I didn't mention it, but I'm five months pregnant. I'm in the stable phase of my pregnancy, so my dad suggested I take this trip to relax, I revealed calmly. That's right, after our divorce, I found someone who truly supports me. My boss at work, who happens to be a subordinate of my father. He has been a great support, both personally and professionally. I found out I was pregnant just five months ago. It was a quick marriage, but my company and my father celebrated it grandly. Mason's face fell, his earlier bravado evaporating as he processed the news. You're pregnant? So were you using birth control? The question was absurd, and I couldn't help but feel a mixture of pity and relief as I looked at him. My life had moved on from the chaos he brought into it. Now, more than ever, I was sure of my path forward. Strengthened by the support of my new husband and the imminent responsibility of leading my father's company, especially as he planned to retire soon due to health reasons. My future, though once intertwined with Mason's, was now firmly my own, filled with new beginnings and free from his shadow. Mason's confusion was palpable as he stomped his feet, bewildered by the revelation. Birth control? I never did that, remember? I told you I had infertility tests at the clinic and they found no issues. So the problem wasn't just with me, I said my words blunt and to the point. His face contorted with the realization, does that mean Diana and I can't have kids? Why did I divorce you to marry Diana? He muttered to himself, his shoulders slumping in defeat. What do you mean why? You felt betrayed knowing he was infertile? Diana snapped back, her anger flaring at Mason's self-centered logic. Realizing I had no reason to engage further, I delivered my final statement. That's why from now on, please keep your affairs separate from mine. Regarding the rent for Goldsmith Enterprises, I expect full payment. If you intend to continue leasing the building, please settle the overdue rent soon. Otherwise, we'll need to pursue legal action. 
I have nothing more to say to you. Goodbye. With that, I left Mason and Diana in mid-argument and confidently returned to my hotel room. Upon my return from the trip, my husband greeted me with a warm smile. Welcome back. Sorry, I couldn't help around the house. Was everything okay? Of course it was fine. I'm just glad you got to relax, Patricia. Thank you, he replied, his smile genuine and comforting. Since marrying my current husband, I felt reassured daily, and thoughts of Mason have faded into the background. After that incident, I didn't see Mason again, but through my father's contacts, I learned that Mason and Diana's situation had worsened. Despite his initial belief that he was marrying into wealth, Mason discovered that Goldsmith Enterprises was steeped in debt. News had spread across TV channels about an employee at Goldsmith Enterprises embezzling millions from clients. Diana's father had known about the fraud, but attempted to cover it up to protect the company's reputation. However, once the scandal became public, Goldsmith Enterprises stock plummeted and the company lost its credibility. A mass exodus of employees followed. In such a dire state, it was clear they couldn't possibly cover their rent, let alone recover from the scandal. This turn of events reaffirmed my relief in having moved on from that chapter in my life, as I focused on a future filled with stability and genuine affection with my new husband.